Yep, the recording started. Great. Okay, so um, my name is Ravi. I'm uh, going to be leading this uh, tutorial this evening on um, pediatric peri rest and life support scenarios. So it's going to be um, a series of SBAs. We've got 10 in total. And it's going to get you to, as he has mentioned, hopefully um, do some application of thinking, but also use it as a springboard to just consolidate some basic information about peri rest, which in my teaching I've noticed sometimes people often forget or miss out. So hopefully this comes as some help, it comes as useful to you. And what we'll be covering is key principles relating to pediatric patients. We'll be covering some cardiac dysrhythmias um, that are important to pediatrics. And basically also looking at how to deal with a patient, a pediatric patient that's coming in and you need to prepare for them. Um, all of this is related, all of the guidelines and things uh, I recommend you look at are the Recess UK guidelines. So assuming you're following a UK MBBS curriculum, that is where you should be looking. And um, finally, some of the stuff I'm covering is, I'm asking you knowledge questions. Um, and that's very important because you need that as the foundation to do your practice. But for things like life support, please make sure you actually know what you're doing in terms of doing the procedures as well as not, not just knowing what a neutral head position is. So practice on the mannequins when you get a chance. Um, and I'm sure your medical schools will try and assess some of these competencies um, in your OSCEs as well. So knowing is one tier of knowledge, but then actually being able to demonstrate um, you can do things correctly is the next step. And of course, um, you guys are all gearing up towards practicing in healthcare and whatever line of work you're in. So um, yeah, please take the knowledge from here and make sure you know how to apply it as well. Okay. So um, we'll go on to our first question. Okay. So we're starting off with a few neonatal or a few newborn questions, and then we'll progress on to some other areas. So a boy is delivered um, at term following an unremarkable antenatal course. Um, the vaginal delivery was uncomplicated and there's no evidence of fetal distress, meconium aspiration, or other risk factors for maternal infection. Um, following cutting the umbilical cord, he is noted to be struggling to breathe. Um, so the clock has been started. Um, he has been dried, wrapped up, and placed under an incubator. What is the next best step to take? Okay, so we've got quite a mix of responses. I think we've got roughly an even spread between options A, B, and D. And then C and E, there's um, fewer people answering, but a similar proportion as well. So I think we need to go over this. So the correct answer is D, okay? It's deliver artificial breaths on air. Now, I'll go over some of this again in a few slides time. So we're going to go through the first three questions together and then go over some theory. But essentially, um, for this question, um, it's asking you about your knowledge of newborn life support. Okay. And at least in the UK, when you uh, graduate, you could very well be an F1 or an F2 doctor on your pediatrics rotation. And you could either be on neonates yourself or on a pediatric, a general pediatrics um, rotor and you could get called to the delivery suite. And it's worth knowing the basics of newborn life support. So um, we only tend to do um, option A, so oropharyngeal suctioning when we think there's an obstruction or clear evidence of some sort of airway um, secretions that are coming in the way. But because there's no evidence of meconium aspiration and you know, there's nothing to indicate any airway compromise, we don't tend to do A um, straight away. 
Um, connecting the saturation probe, now that is important, but it is less of a priority compared to actually delivering the artificial breaths on air, okay? And then when it comes to delivering high flow oxygen, we tend to be a bit cautious with that with babies, especially neonates um, and especially premature babies. So the reason we initially do not use oxygen is because of the risk of retinopathy of prematurity. So there's um, free radical oxygen damage. And actually there are some physiological changes between um, uh, your, while you're in utero and when you come um, out and essentially your lungs are filled with amniotic fluid and they're not as compliant. And what you really need to do is just get some oxygen or just need to get some air in to try and push out um, the uh, amniotic fluid. So we need to give breaths on air. And I'll go over the algorithm and some more theory as we go along in the next few slides. But just bear that in mind for now. So the correct answer is D, deliver artificial breaths on air. Okay? And that is as per the um, Rhesus Council UK's newborn life support guideline. Okay. And going on to question two, a boy is delivered at term following a, a complicated intrapartum course. He was strangulated by his umbilical cord. He is profoundly bradycardic with a heart rate at 40 beats per minute. Chest compressions are commenced. So the question is, what ratio of compressions to breaths should the resuscitation team deliver? So, overwhelmingly, 50% of people have gone for option D, and there's an even smattering for all the other options. Right, so the correct answer for this one is actually A. And I can see why people went for D, because when you do um, pediatric life support, so in children, um, you would do 15 to 2. But for newborns, you do a 3 to 1 um, compression to breaths ratio. Okay. And we'll, I'll summarize that later on. But once again, this is all with, included within the Rhesus Council UK's newborn life support guidelines, which you can access online. And then finally, um, a boy born at 31 weeks gestation, so he's premature, is admitted to neonatal intensive care following ventricular, ventricular hemorrhage. The boy is at risk of central apneas. On the ward round, there is a pause in his breathing that is lasting 15 seconds. What is the most appropriate course of action? Once again, an even spread of answers between options A, C, and D, and then a handful of people, people picking options B and E. So the correct answer is C, okay? And essentially, um, with children who have apneas, provided it's not lasting too long, you want to try and physically stimulate them first to see if you can trigger them to breathe spontaneously by themselves, okay? And you may well start noticing them desaturating a little, um, but provided too much time has not progressed, you want to keep up the physical stimulation, you want to just sort of rub their chest, tickle their feet, just give them a, uh, keep them lying down, but give them a firm squeeze and shake on their shoulders and see if they can start breathing. And you might have to be a bit patient. Initially, when you first see it, it is a bit scary, 
um, but often you can get them to spontaneously start breathing again during an apneic episode. Um, if that doesn't work, you then need to start um, putting on high flow oxygen and then commencing um, your CPR algorithm because they're now going to respiratory risk. Okay. Um, they may eventually need to be intubated um, and doxapram is a respiratory stimulant. We don't tend to use it that much in pediatrics. Um, I think mainly in an intensive care setting, but even then. Yeah, so it's not, um, you might see doxapram being used um, as respiratory stimulant in some specific adult settings. Um, and that's still quite rare, but it's even rarer in pediatrics. But the first course of action you do is try and stimulate the child. Okay. So, sorry, I'm just putting this on the side. So, to summarize the last few slides, um, we're just going to go over a bit about newborn life support. Now, the key thing you need to know about is the physiological changes um, between the uterine environment and when you come out. So, in utero, your lungs are filled with amniotic fluid, and sometimes um, uh, vaginal contractions during delivery can compress bits of the umbilical cord and can cause transient episodes of hypoxia. And essentially, you need to stimulate, the first step is to stimulate um, babies when they're struggling to breathe. Okay. And the thing from this algorithm you need to know really well is the first 60 seconds here, the golden minute. Okay. And the key difference between uh, neonatal life support and all the other forms of CPR is that your um, compressions to breaths ratio is three to one. Okay. A neonatal baseline heart rate is really high. It's well above 100. Yeah? You still go, you still try and apply your um, compressions at 100 to 120 beats a minute. Yeah? But in addition to them having a high heart rate at birth, they also have a much higher rest rate compared to the normal of around 12 by adults, which is why you also need to have a much tighter ratio between compressions to breaths. Okay? And if we take a look at this as the golden minute more closely, the very first step you need to do when the baby comes out is to dry the baby. You need to work really hard at maintaining their normal temperature, and then you need to start the clock, okay? Now, drying the baby is really quick and it's quite vigorous, so that in and of itself will stimulate the baby if they're having any breathing difficulties, okay? You assess their tone, breathing, and heart rate after you've dried them and put them on an incubator. And you might have been taught if they're premature, um, you might very quickly, um, instead of drying them straight away, you might actually wrap them in cling film just to maintain their temperature. Okay. And then if they've got abnormal breathing, you need to um, open their airway and then you give five inflation breaths. And this is usually on room air, okay? You do not connect up the oxygen. And then if you take a look at the algorithm, it's very important. So it says consider um, saturations monitoring and ECG monitoring, but that should come after this, okay? You do not want to waste time trying to faff around with the SATS probe and hook up ECG leads. Yeah, you need to give the five inflation breaths straight away, slow breaths, maybe around three seconds in duration for each breath, okay? And then you can reassess after you've given the five inflation breaths, okay? And then you can put on things like SATS probe. Okay. And then, as mentioned, we do things on air as well because we are concerned about oxygen toxicity. But this is all in the guideline. And yeah, the main thing you need to know about is the first minute. And often as the junior, you might be the one who will actually be involved in trying the baby and just um, moving the baby to the incubator and so on. But then it's important you know what's going on. So this is the guideline to look at, um, provided you're following a UK MBBS curriculum. And you need, it's on the Resource Council UK. And the key bits I really recommend you read are sections three and section five. Section three is really short. It's really, really short. It's only a couple of paragraphs, but it's really worth reading. So you have some baseline understanding about what's going on, okay? And then section five is the actual guideline itself. It's broken down into very clear chunks. And it's just worth reading in full 
And then once you've read it, you can then look at the algorithm. But there is extra details in the suggested sequence events that explain the algorithm in a bit more detail about precisely what you do. Okay. And those are the key areas you should focus on. So going on to question four. So now I've got a younger child. So the parents of several young children with congenital heart defects are being taught pediatric life support. So quite a common scenario on pediatric cardiology wards. And um, the question is, to what depth should the parents be advised to aim for when performing chest compressions? We have 75% of people going for option D, and then a handful of people going for the other ones. Okay. And the correct answer is D. Well done. So um, essentially with children, so with pediatric patients, we use a relative depth. And then for adults, we use an absolute depth. So for adults, the answer would be five centimeters. And then for children, it is one third of the chest depth. You would not, E would not be correct under any circumstance. Um, essentially, when you are doing compressions, you won't be really applying enough pressure for you to feel a central carotid pulse. Okay, and if you do feel a carotid pulse, um, that's when you, you know, confirm your pulse checks. You'll do it on your pulse checks um, during a CPR scenario. And then you'd want to do a rhythm check to see whether it's a, whether there's an um, appropriate rhythm, okay? So, pediatric compressions. So, the key things to know about are essentially these are the three main uh, forms of resuscitation that you need to be aware of. The rate is the same in all of them. For children and newborns, the depth is at one third of the chest. Whereas in adults, we try to go for five centimeters. Okay? And then the key difference between all of them is the ratio. So, the difference between um, compressions to breath. So you do three to one in newborns, 15 to two in the young child, and then with adults, you do 30 to two. Um, this diagram here shows where you would place your hands and how you place them. So typically with adults, as I'm sure you're all aware, you interlock your fingers and use both hands. But with a child, you often use one hand. However, if they're a big child or they're um, approaching adolescence or in adolescence, you may well want to do compressions the adult way. And it may also depend on how big you are as well and how strong you are to do your compressions as it is quite tiring and does require a lot of force. And then with infants, you use two fingers. And the important thing with doing compressions on infants with your fingers is essentially you want to try and make sure your fingers are as perpendicular as possible so that the full force uh, you apply goes straight down. Um, as if they're more oblique, you are applying less force, okay? And um, this, di this diagram here just shows how you might arrange your fingers. But this is more commonly assessed in OSCEs, but this, uh, the, uh, the bullet points here are more knowledge-based things that you would need to apply in an OSCE or you could get an SBA on. Okay. And then the other key difference, okay, is airway positioning. Now, I'm really sorry I couldn't put any pictures on here. Um, I couldn't find any appropriate images that weren't copyright free. But I would recommend you Google, Googling to try and find some pictures or looking through an appropriate life support manual where they show you the positions. Okay, Because often people don't quite know the difference between neutral position and um, the sniffing position. So we'll start off with adults, actually, or older children and adolescents. Um, and the, Essentially, you treat them the same way you treat adults in terms of opening the airway. You do a head tilt, chin lift, okay? And the reason we have these different positions is because over time, your airway shape changes, okay? And then for young children, we have what's called the sniffing position. 
Um, I think often you might hear it being called sniffing the morning air. And I often found that particularly quite hard to um, conceptualize because no one precisely tells you what that means. So just like, oh, just imagine someone sniffing. And the way to think about it is if you imagine someone flexing their neck, going into full flexion uh, and then extending it, that is the sniffing position. Okay. So it is not from a neutral position and then extending it like that. It is if you go from flexion and then up a bit, that's the sniffing position. And then for babies, what we call the neutral position is where the nose and the chin should be on the same horizontal plane. So if you are to draw a line connecting the nose to the chin, it should be a perfectly flat line. Yeah. And that's how you can assess somebody's in the neutral position. And what tends to help with that is babies often have quite a large occiput, so they can um, balance by themselves in that position. Okay. Question five. A four-year-old boy is found collapsed on the floor. He's unresponsive and does not have a pulse. Sorry, that should say what rhythm is the resuscitation team most likely to find on his ECG? And this is a tricky question. This would be like a very stretching question in um, MBBS finals or pediatrics finals if you do it in a different year. Okay, and we have pretty much an even spread um, across all the options. So the correct answer here is asystole. Now, the key thing to mention is options A, C, D, and E, they are all arrest rhythms, okay? So this boy, he's unresponsive and he does not have a pulse, okay? So he's in cardiac arrest. So one thing you could rule out is option B, right? Because the four arrest rhythms are A, C, D, and E. Now, after that, it just relies on a small bit of knowledge, which is that essentially asystole is the most common um, reason why children rest, or is the most common rhythm found, okay? And there is no real clear mechanism behind this. It is thought to be related to the fact that most children actually um, go into, the reason they have cardio um, respiratory arrest is that it's driven by respiratory arrest first, whereas in adults often they have a cardiac cause. And then that results finally in asystole. So it's not an intrinsic dysrhythmia of the heart. Um, but overall, asystole is the most common rhythm found. Okay. Um, but just please bear in mind, SVT is not a cardiac arrest rhythm. Okay. Question six. A 14-year-old girl is admitted following an overdose. She loses consciousness during the clocking and has no pulse. CPR is commenced. When the ECG is all connected, it shows the rhythm below. What is the most appropriate course of action? So overwhelmingly, 73% of you went for option A, and then roughly equal amounts went for options B and C, and then a few of you went for options D and E. Um, so yeah, the correct answer is A. So I think, my, so this is a, a relatively simple data interpretation question where you get, you get told they're in essentially cardiac arrest, and then you have a bit of data to interpret, and then you've got to work out the next thing. So the first step is identifying the rhythm. 
and this is a shockable rhythm, it is ventricular fibrillation, okay? And then therefore, the moment you have a shockable rhythm, you want to try and get a um, shock in as soon as possible, yeah? And just like with adults, the key things to the chain of survival are good um, quality compressions and timely defibrillation the moment it's available and you're able to do it. Okay. So that would be the most appropriate thing to do. Continue compressions would be the most appropriate answer should it be a non-shockable rhythm. Okay. Calcium gluconate you'd give if they were hyperkalemic and they had hyperkalemic changes. And then eventually in the cardiac arrest algorithm, you would give adrenaline. And then atropine is something you would give in a bradycardic situation, but this patient is not bradycardic and they are in cardiac arrest. Okay. So with pediatric arrests, they are rare. They generally are rare, but when they do happen, um, asystole is the most common dysrhythmia. It's important to bear in mind that respiratory causes are more common than circulatory causes. And you also see that reflected in your initial steps because with children, we, off, we do rescue breaths first before the compressions. Whereas with adults, when you confirm they're pulseless and they're not breathing, you commence straight onto chest compressions. In pediatrics, it's the other way around. And with children, you do five rescue breaths first, okay? And then it's the same rules as adults. So the shockable rhythms are the same. It's ventricular fibrillation, or if they have pulseless or unstable VT. Okay. So question seven. A two-year-old boy was brought to the emergency department after his mother said he was behaving oddly. On triage, his heart rate was found to be over 250 beats per minute. His ECG is shown below. He's alert with a normal blood pressure reading. What is the most appropriate course of action? Okay, so no one's gone for option A, so no one's administering something like CPAP. And then there's a roughly even split between options B and C, so ice water submersion or adenosine, and then a few people, roughly in equal amounts, again around 15% going for D and E. So the correct answer is B, okay? Now, this is where um, option C is technically also a correct answer but you would want to try option B first. So this boy is, the rhythm you can see here is supraventricular tachycardia. And essentially it is the pediatric, if you are to learn one dysrhythmia within pediatrics, it's this one. It's the most common one that children have, okay? And the way you treat it is essentially, you try and trigger the mammalian dive reflex, which forces a vagal maneuver. Um, to slow the heart rate down. So what you tend to do is you um, get a, um, well, you get a container, fill it with water, fill it with ice, yeah? And often pediatric units do have um, ice available, or you can go to the emergency department to get lots of ice. And then you wrap your baby up, and then you just submerge most of their face in the ice water for around, well, for quite a while, actually. It's like, it feels long, it feels like quite a long time when you're doing it, about like sometimes five, five seconds or so. And then you need to have cardiac monitoring up on them as well. And you can see whether that can um, resolve their dysrhythmia, okay? And you can try this several times. And sometimes you might notice um, several submersions of the child will gradually bring their heart rate down, okay? However, if they're still in SVT after that, we need to give IV adenosine 
And it's really important to have full cardiac monitoring when you're doing this, okay? And um, what IV adenosine does is it effectively resets the cycle by causing a block to your AV node, okay? And when you are administering adenosine, you need to have full cardiac monitoring and you need to make sure the ECG machine is recording or you're printing recording strips, rhythm strips the whole time, because you need to show this to um, pediatric cardiologists when they want more information so they can analyze the rhythm properly. Okay. We do not administer amiodarone or bisoprolol acutely for um, SVT. Okay, and uh, CPAP, we don't do it at all. And typically um, this is done with babies and often it's with very young children. Um, I see a question has popped up saying, do you sub submerge the entire child in the ice bath? Um, no, just their face. And how compliant are children? Well, if they're a baby, um, it's done to them. And then with children, um, I've not really seen it done in anyone over the age of three. Um, as in, I've not seen any child going to SVT over the age of three. Um, but I imagine you would have negotiated or pushed them towards it. Otherwise, you would need to go ahead with the adenosine. But just bear in mind, adenosine does carry risks. Okay. So with SVT, as mentioned, it's the most common dysrhythmia in children. And acutely, you would want to do vagal maneuvers. So if children are not compliant or it's just not going to happen, you can, and they are old enough to understand, you can try and get them to do a Valsalva maneuver. So you can give them a syringe to blow into and try and get them, you know, you just give them a 50 mil syringe and say, blow as hard as you can and try and push the stopper all the way to the top and get them to do it multiple times. And that can also have a similar effect. Or you can trigger the mammalian dive reflex, which works really well in babies. Yeah. And um, if that doesn't work, so after your vagal maneuvers fail, just like in adults, you then progress to adenosine. Okay. Now that's the acute management. Long term management, these patients get beta blockers, okay, which um, can slow the heart rate down. But definitive management is radiofrequency ablation. So that um, involves them going to um, usually a cardiac or IR center and specialist uh, interventional cardiologists. Um, will essentially try and find um, aberrant patterns on the heart muscle and they will uh, try and ablate the heart to try and cut off the rhythm. Okay. And um, there's another question is, how do they breathe if their face is in the water? So um, as part of the mammalian dive reflex, um, you hold your breath. So if you're unsure about the mammalian dive reflex and didn't cover it in your preclinical physiology, um, that's worth quickly reading up on. It doesn't, there's not much to know. Yeah. But it's, a, it's, it's effectively a reflex that's sh uh, well, shed between mammals, um, especially useful in water animals in particular. Um, so less useful in us, but we still have the reflex to a, to a lesser degree. Okay, question eight. A 15-year-old girl is admitted with pneumonia, which is being treated with clarithromycin. She has been having regular temperatures despite taking paracetamol, so has had ibuprofen added as well. She has also been prescribed cyclosine PRN to help with the nausea. Um, she was commenced on progesterone, um, the progesterone only pill, two months ago by her GP, and her past medical history includes long QT syndrome. So with all those drugs she's on, which drug should be changed on her drug chart? So half of the people have gone for option C and the next most popular option is 30% going for option E. So 
Clastromycin is the correct answer. So um, macrolides in particular are known to um, further prolong or have a risk of prolonging your QT interval. So somebody with long QT syndrome, you should try to avoid the drug if you can. Now, cyclosine is an interesting answer because um, antiemetics, most antiemetics can. Cyclosine does so slightly, but the, it's nowhere near as common as clarithromycin. Okay? And generally, depending on what lists you look up, um, often ondansetron is the main culprit of the antiemetics. Okay? Paracetamol, ibuprofen, and progesterone don't tend to do so. So the reason we worry about long QT syndrome is the risk of ventricular tachycardia and some death. Okay. It can be inherited or inquired, acquired, and essentially the two commonest causes are Romana Ward and Brugada syndromes. And they're essentially channelopathies in your cardiac muscle. Okay. I think they predominantly implicate the sodium channels. Yeah. Um, for those aiming for like distinctions and finals, if you can, if you're able to uh, work out um, what the Romana Ward or Brigada syndrome ECG dysrhythmia looks like, um, often in adult medicine that would stand you very well. But if you just know that these two are the main inherited causes, that's more than enough um, knowledge for most people. The second one is more important acquired. So when you're going to be working on the wards, you will often find patients who have long QT syndrome in their past medical history, and in which case it's worth knowing which drugs cause it. The list is really long, so it's worth trying to compartmentalize drugs by categories and mechanisms of action. So the macrolide antibiotics, so clarithromycin, erythromycin, azithromycin, tend to do it. Um, quinolones, yeah, so uh, things like ciprofloxacin, um, that should say not tricycles, tricyclics, tricyclic antidepressants and antipsychotics. A lot of the drugs used in psychiatry um, do long QT syndrome, and you'll often see in psychiatry, he, um, psychiatrists want an ECG to begin with to establish what their baseline QT segment is like, QT interval is like. And then odansetron is the most common out of the antiemetics. The list is longer, um, but essentially, when you are working on the wards and you know someone has this, what you really want to do is measure their ECG, do an ECG as soon as you can, document what the length is, and then after they've had the drug for a little while, you want to um, repeat the ECG just to make sure the segment is not prolonging. And if it is, you switch the drug. And an even better step beforehand would be to see if you can use an alternative drug that is not known to um, extend the QT, sec uh, QT interval. And you can easily discuss things with pharmacists who can help you. Um, and if you really don't have an alternative drug, you can always discuss with pharmacy again, just to see if they can um, advise further or discuss with a cardiologist. Um, and that's the same in adults and pediatrics. So in pediatrics, you'd call um, a pediatric cardiologist or a pediatrician with a special interest in cardiology, and they'd be able to advise, yeah? But if, if it can't be avoided, you just want to do um, ECGs to monitor and make sure the segment is not prolonging. Question nine. A six-year-old girl with a known peanut allergy had an anaphylactic reaction at a friend's birthday party. Mother treated her at the scene using an adrenaline auto-injector and brought her to the emergency department where she received chlorphenamine and hydrocortisone. Her observations on arrival were normal, apart from a mild tachycardia. One hour later, she's asymptomatic and looks well. A repeat set of observations are underway. What is the most appropriate course of action? Okay, 
there's roughly an even split between all the answers, A to D, and a few people picking option E. So, the correct answer is option B, okay? And the reason this is the case is because with anaphylaxis, um, you can have what is known as a biphasic reaction. So all the guidelines say, um, whether you're dealing with children or adults, they advise people being admitted for at minimum six, ideally six to 12 hours of observation after their initial anaphylactic event, okay? And the main reason we actually give steroids um, in anaphylaxis, the main prognostic benefit it has for the patients is that it minimizes the risk of the, a biophasic reaction. So having a second episode a couple of hours later on. Um, and the important thing to note is that children are far, far more predisposed to having biophasic reactions for some reason. So it's really important that you do not just discharge them because they look well. And their observations may be fine, they may feel well, and their parents may want to go, but you just need to say, we need to keep you here a bit longer just to make sure that they're okay. And when they do get discharged, you need to make sure you give them new um, adrenaline auto injectors. Ideally, they should have two copies that are always in date. Um, at the moment, there is a shortage of adrenaline auto injectors. So I think lots of hospitals are giving one and advising patients keep that on them the whole time. Um, because there's a shortage worldwide, actually. Um, but ideally, you want them to have two, and it was common protocols. Uh, it, it was common practice. Okay. So you would not do A um, purely because that is unsafe. Um, option C would be an overkill. And then D, sort, D is sort of along the right lines, but um, you would not, it's not because of a certain parameter being abnormal. They could appear completely well. We still need to observe them. And once again, E, you do not need to observe them for 24 hours. Um, if just one parameter is abnormal. So just to remind you, um, I'm sure you're all familiar with this, um, but anaphylaxis is a medical emergency you need to know about and is one of the few things your medical schools may ask you to know the dosing for, for adrenaline. And that's purely because for most other things, you can often look up the dose or you use various drugs um, frequently enough to know the doses. And essentially, um, with adrenaline, with anaphylaxis, you need to know the dose quick enough because it is rapidly progressing. So you don't have time to look things up. Yeah. And for, um, so as a junior doctor, you would essentially be giving intramuscular adrenaline. And that is one in a thousand. Um, and a useful way some people find to remember that is. Um, IM is almost like the equivalent of the Roman numerals for one in a thousand. I is for one and M like millennium, thousand. Um, that might be one way you might find it helpful to remember. Okay. But you need to know the dosing for children and adults. Um, or your med, your med school may expect you to know the dosing. I'll double check with your individual med schools. But you do an ABC approach, but the moment you suspect anaphylaxis, you need to give adrenaline. And that is the most important treatment to give out of the entire set. Yeah, even if they are starting to, if they are hypotensive, you still give the adrenaline first. Okay, so as mentioned, anaphylaxis, you give IM adrenaline. We are worried about a biphasic reaction um, in people that come into hospital, um, but the risk is highest in children, but you still have the same concern with adults. So you need to monitor them for at least six hours, even if they appear well. And then you need to ensure patients are supplied with auto injectors. And the final thing to bear in mind is that an urticarial rash alone does not mean they've got anaphylaxis. Okay? Um, so they are allergic to something, but it doesn't mean they've got an anaphylactic reaction. Okay? An urticarial rash alone is not life-threatening. And then finally, question 10. A four-year-old boy is being brought to the emergency department by ambulance. He has been seizing for 20 minutes at home and was given a dose of buccal midazolam by the paramedics. 
what is the most appropriate dose of lorazepam to prepare in advance of his arrival? Hmm, a range of options. Essentially an even spread between most of the options. So um, there is only one correct answer here, and that is option B, a 1.6 milligrams. Option E is the dose which you would give to adults, I believe. Right? I've not, sorry, I've not treated adults for quite a few years now, but when I last did, I think four milligrams is on the algorithm for um, stasis epilepticus for adults. And we can run through how you get this calculation in a second. But essentially, the challenge with pediatrics is the dose varies per, as per the child's weight. And when you have pediatric patients being blue lighted in, you do not know their weight. Um, so what we have is things like a, APLS have de, um, protocols have developed various ways to estimate people's weight. And there are several ways of doing this, but a lot of them rely on you knowing the patient's age. And then depending on their age, you can apply a different formula to get their weight. Another way to estimate um, their weight is when they're physically with you in hospital, you might see in resuscitation areas and um, in emergency departments, the child might be on the, the transfer mat, that the, the pat slide that the patient's on has a measuring tape on it. And it even has, you can even put the child at the end of that tray and it gives you their height. And along the way, the ladder tells you their height and then a weight estimate. Or the alternative to that is something called a Broslow tape, um, which I think is what APLS primarily recommends, which is where you essentially have a measuring tape and you run it along the length of the child. And as you run it along, it tells you what weight is an estimate for that length. And then based on that weight, you can then prescribe your drugs, okay? So the way we get this answer is we use the wet flag um, protocol, okay? And this is when you prepare for a pediatric emergency coming in, okay? So it, it all starts off with knowing their weight. So you need to know their age. And if you don't know their age, um, you'll probably get someone giving you an estimate over the phone if they just find a child unaccompanied, um, might give you an estimate. And then once you have that, you can start preparing everything else for the main emergency scenarios. Okay, so for this one, okay, we had sorry, let me go back, a four-year-old child. So we need to do twice the age plus eight. So two times four is eight, plus eight is 16. Okay, and then we get the dose of lorazepam for a seizure. We need to do 0.1 milligrams per kilo. Okay, so we know we we're going to assume he's 16 kilos, therefore 0.1 milligram per kilo means he's one point, you need the dose of 1.6 milligrams. And for those of you that have done your pediatric rotations or been on emergency department rotations, you will often see in pediatric resource areas, there are folders by every pediatric bed, which basically have the wet flag doses in five kilo intervals. So you don't have to work it out from scratch to minimize errors. So the moment you have the age, you can then work out this estimated weight and then you just very quickly flick to the closest um, interval of five kilos and draw up the drugs according to that or close to that. Yeah. Um, the important thing to bear in mind with fluids is that we normally give, this is for a bolus by the way, we give, um, we always use crystalloids. So 0.9% sodium chloride is the main one um, for boluses. And we usually give 20 mils per kilo, unless they're a, they're a trauma case, in which case we give 10 mils per kilo. The other one we give 10 mils per kilo for is if they're in heart failure. Um, and depending on when you did pediatrics, um, I know some of you might have done it a few years ago and you're now about to sit finals, um, 
depending on when you last did your pediatric rotation, please bear in mind that the DKA protocols have changed. So the BSPED DKA guidelines um, used to recommend 10 milligrams per kilo um, for fluid boluses in children with DKA. But the latest guidelines were updated in January this year. No, it's now not this year, it's now last year. Sorry, we're in 2021, aren't we? Um, so in January 2020, um, they were updated and it's now 20 mil per kilo bolus. Okay. But it is worth knowing wet flag, if nothing else. So this provides um, a nice two step question where it essentially asks you first of all, you need the age, then you need to know two components of the wet flag. You first need to know the W, so you do that correctly, and then you do the L. Yeah. And that's how you can get the correct answer. Okay, it's a handy mnemonic to know. So I think that brings us to the end. Um, and I think I've seen most of these questions in the chat. Um, but um, any remaining questions I'll answer after we stop the recording.